Once I fell into a six-week-long downward spiral that culminated in disaster. After four years together, my boyfriend and I broke up, despite our mutual love for cats, raves, drugs, and each other. Soon he started dating two of my friends. Then I unwisely had a rebound with a bass player who was all wrong. I had a health crisis when I didn't have insurance. I jeopardized my career by horribly procrastinating work that was due by Christmas. And I really, really wanted to do drugs again. At the time, I was two months sober, the longest that I had ever been since I was 15. It was like I had just barely rounded this corner, and there was a huge pileup in my path. Surely, I'd never, ever, ever be happy again. So I hurtled towards self-destruction. I was, as I wrote at the time, speeding on slick, twisty streets, seat beltless, waiting for gods to make themselves known, which was accurate foreshadowing on my part and an interesting way to put it because I grew up without religion and had always identified as atheist. I think I needed something to love about life. Ultimately, I didn't get high, but what I did instead was throw myself into work violently to distract myself. I turned into speed racer, working 80 hours that week, forgetting to sleep or eat, and intentionally not having even a moment to think or feel. There was so little time to spare that I dropped off the project on my way to Phoenix for Christmas. As soon as it left my hands, extreme relief and exhaustion set in. All week I'd run on empty. I hadn't slept more than six hours. And normally, I sleep hard and long in any awkward place, sometimes mid-sentence with a drink in my lap. Feeling woozy, I pulled over for coffee in a granola bar. When I got back on the road, there was a lot of holiday traffic and a high wind warning. I started to nod off, but jerked awake. In that moment, I could think of nothing but misery in my life. And I made a decision. This I would power through, full speed ahead like any engineer of a soon-to-be train wreck. I turned up the music, and I stayed in the fast lane. Though I was aware I was falling asleep, I just didn't give a shit. Next thing I knew, I regained consciousness just as my tires hit gravel. There was no shoulder, and I was drifting off the freeway. Instead of gently decelerating and turning with the skid, I failed driver instructors everywhere by slamming on the brakes and yanking the wheel. I overcorrected at 85 miles per hour and started to skid around in a circle. As I spun to 90 degrees, it struck me that I might not regain control of this vehicle. I continued around 180 degrees, now facing all that traffic. Briefly, I made eye contact with the driver in the car behind me and saw his shocked expression. I was horrified. Not about what might happen to me, but about the traumatic injuries and deaths that would ensue in the pileup. All my fault. At 181 degrees, I realized these were actual people. Families on vacation. And here I was, a depressed asshole who, if I didn't kill them all, was about to make them watch me kill myself. I lost sight of them as I swept around at 200 degrees. That's when the car caught air and started to flip. As it happened, the car rolled sideways off the freeway, where the ground had been softened by a rare bout of rain, and just missed the cliffs and boulders. Because I was flipping so fast, I saw only a blur of brown as my car hit the ground. I closed my eyes to protect them from breaking glass as the car crunched, rolled, and bounced again. By that second roll, I knew nothing I could do could stop what was coming. It was freeing the most peaceful feeling. I sensed something with me in the car as it filled with warmth and light. Even with my eyes closed, it was bright. As I slammed the ground a third time, I felt safe, like on roller coasters I've been riding since I was barely tall enough, slightly thrilled, but not at all threatened. In fact, I was basking in comfort, didn't feel pain or get impaled far as I could tell, and I was conscious through all five rolls. Then I glided to a stop, upside down, hanging from my seatbelt. Someone ran over. All I could say was, oh, fuck. He said, we're EMTs, it's okay. And I said, fuck. (laughs) 
Wait, how did you get here so fast? By happenstance, a car full of off-duty paramedics had seen it all go down. <laughs> they quickly pulled me through the window because my car was smoking and they thought it might explode. I felt grateful to be in such good hands. As we waited for the fire trucks, I surveyed all the heavy, dangerous items in my car that were now scattered around. A 100-pound suitcase in my back seat ripped open, a butcher knife for my sister, and other loose Christmas presents, hardback books, essential oils in glass bottles, one stuck in the sunroof, shoes, this full metal bottle now dented, rolled coins in the console, and numerous other hazards. Also, my glasses flew through the window into shrubs, without a scratch. Same with my GPS and my phone. Remarkably, nothing hit or cut me. I had no bruises or even scratches. A sheriff, tow truck driver, and EMTs showed up and asked, where's the driver? Meaning, where's the body? And each was astonished when I waved. I heard them telling stories about me in the way that you'd talk about a celebrity who showed up at your party. And they were taking pictures, not for evidence, but for Facebook or whatever. <laughs> While we waited for the tow truck to flip my car over, the grizzled old cop told me about a World War II pilot who was shot down and jumped without a chute. He fell two miles and survived. I'm telling you this, he said, because you're the pilot who bailed and lived. Oh, if only he knew how I'd bailed on life. When I got into the tow truck, the driver said, Wow, the sheriff's in a good mood. He don't see accidents like that where people live. You made his day. <laughs> and what made everyone's day is no other vehicles were involved in the crash. Before the driver put his truck in gear, he said, Seatbelt, and I said, Yup. <laughs> and we both laughed. Next day, I hopped into the driver's seat of a rental car to see my sister. While we were getting ready, she reached over and plucked one of my hairs. Just a gray hair, she said. She didn't know that I had never had one. Suddenly, I just lost it. I cried that I was getting old, but that instead of maturing, I was regressing. That I had traded drug benders for work benders, during which I made risky decisions and wrecked a great paid-off car. Then I bawled about how stupid it was to cry about a car and getting old, considering I almost didn't have that opportunity. I thought of the things left untended in my home, my cat and the awkward stuff, the bestiality souvenir I bought accidentally in Bali, <laughs> the unflushed toilet, my sick and twisted journals that my family would have found. All the while, for the first time ever, my sister held me while I cried. Though I had sought death, I was meant to be alive. And that presence I felt in the car, I don't need to say, it was angels or it was God. I can't name it. And God forbid I become one of those people who won't shut up about Jesus. <laughs> but calling myself atheist no longer felt honest. All the casual coincidences that added up to one big miracle of me surviving my unconscious suicide attempt, it felt like something more was at work. Especially since that same week, my ex also rolled his truck on a mountainside with my two friends in it. And they were all okay. It seems that it took flipping upside down for me to get a new perspective on the life that I had so carelessly discarded. I fought me, and I won. And lost. Thank you.